All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. It is, well, it is April. I hope everyone's had a great start to their April. It's April Fool's Day today. I know I got up this morning and I played some pranks uh, on my kids here. I replaced uh, my son's toothpaste with mayonnaise. He wasn't super happy when he tried to brush his teeth this morning. And then I froze my daughter's orange juice. So when she tried to drink her orange juice this morning with her straw, things didn't go so well. So I hope, I hope you had some pranks played on you. I hope you're able to play some pranks on maybe your parents or your teachers today. Uh, if you're joining us in North America, you still got a few hours left to get something done. So uh, we wish you the best with your April Fool's action. Uh, I am so excited for today's event. We, if you've been following along since uh, last summer, we've been following uh, Aaron Ruches. He has embarked on an epic journey uh, rowing solo across uh, the Pacific Ocean, north of the equator. We caught him in California uh, when we got to see the boat uh, before he headed out. We caught him in Hawaii when he uh, reached those islands and was having a little refresh. We had some live events from the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We caught up in Guam, and here we go. Uh, Erdan is in the Philippines right now, so it's a little bit later in the evening for him, but we're excited to catch up. Uh, for a little bit and see how the rest of the journey has gone. So let's bring him in with us right now. Hey, Erdin, how are you? I am well. Glad to be back, Joe. Yeah, you. Uh, I mean, it's later for you, so your April Fools is in the past. I wonder, and, and anything fun happened this morning? Did you get anybody? <laughs> I did not actually intentionally try, but we uh, uh, we did get our boat secured, and all of those are resolved. So. I am happy. Uh, no April Fool's jokes on me this time. That's uh, that's a good start to your April. So let's let let's get into that a little bit. The last time that we caught up with you, uh, I'm going to share my screen really quickly here because I have a few slides. So the last time we connected, and I think this might be the wrong order, so I'm just going to bump it back up to the top here. There we go. Uh, I think this is you leaving Guam. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Uh, this was right in front of the Mariana's Yacht Club in Guam Harbor, about two miles east of the entrance to the Opera Harbor. So yeah. the little dinghy is going to tow me to a larger vessel, and they're going to tow me to the Opera Harbor entrance. From there, I'm on my own. Yeah, I think uh, when we caught you in Guam, it was another late one. It was even later, I think, when, when we caught you uh, and you were able to connect with us. But uh, so... Yeah, it's it's 11 p.m. here. I am sitting on the floor of my bunk bed, on the, in front of my bunk bed in a hostel here in Legazpi. So, yeah. So we've got a few more images here that'll tell a little bit of the story. Now, some of these I think are from before you arrived in Guam, but I think it's always great to see a few images from uh, from out in the open ocean. But I thought I'd flash the map up here just to kind of, I mean, wow, just to kind of follow this track. Yeah, yeah. Uh, across the Pacific. That is, that represents about 112 degrees of longitude that I traveled. Considering the Earth is 360 degrees, that tells you how much ground I covered. Pacific is a huge ocean. Yeah, you, you shared a photo on your, uh, your social media earlier. Uh, with It was like with Earth in a question mark, but it was just the right angle where all yeah. you see is Pacific Ocean. You see yeah. kind of a tiny little bit of maybe New Zealand and maybe like a tiny bit uh, of a couple other little spots. But yeah, our planet is blue. It is a blue planet. I am going to, uh, once I get home and have access to my laptop, I'm going to grab this track that you see as a KML file, put it into yeah. a Google Earth representation so you can spin the Earth and see how much of the uh, Earth's... Uh, you know how, how how long of a track this actually is yeah on a flat map it doesn't look as impressive but still oh yeah i mean absolutely no question this is an amazing uh distance covered and as i flash through a few photos here uh you know of just out in 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 the ocean so you can see the beautiful days that you had we've got a little rainbow here some company it looks like a little red-footed booby and then you yes. can see other days here that maybe just weren't weren't as nice. Yes. 
So this is after I left Guam. I had a series of squalls that kept passing south of me, bringing me winds from different directions. Depending on where the squall is, you get wind from that direction. And uh, I mean, it could be just deluge of rain. This series of squalls created dangerous conditions, uh, upwards of 30 plus knots of wind in a hurry that would arrive. So I had to be mindful. I had to be careful and patient with these. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, it seems like you're alone on a big open ocean, but different stages. You had lots of company. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, when I was near islands, uh, uh, near atolls or south of the uh, series of islands that extend uh, northwest, west northwest from Hawaii toward French Frigate Shoals, all the way out to Midway Islands. Uh, those are home to many of these birds. These are boobies that you see here. All of them are red-footed boobies. Um, yeah, they frequented my boats and they took liberty to poop on my deck and I had to clean the deck all the time. I see some were pretty friendly too. Yeah, this one was my companion. Stayed with me for five days. I saw this one landed on my oar that was tied to the side and it was trying to scratch its neck because what they do is they prune themselves all the time. Uh, he could reach everywhere with his beak, but then of course with the neck, he had to use his feet. And each time he lifted one foot, he would lose his balance and have to put it right back down. I said, this guy is having trouble. So I reached over slowly. It gave me this little tweezer action with the beak. I didn't back off. I reached past that and reached his neck and ruffled his uh, neck feathers a little bit, just like uh, I had my pet cockatiel that, I had, cockatiel that I had. He liked that and then came closer and wanted more, like my puppy, turned its head, trying to get more scratches here and there. And then he liked it and stayed. And he would just come and land and seek petting and land on my deck stay on my deck i couldn't feed it other than the few flying fish that arrived eventually it took off it stayed with me for five full days really wow. special yeah amazing and then uh you know can't not show a photo of, of in the water once in a while i guess you'd look down and you you'd sometimes see something else yeah i thought this was a marlin uh i saw this it had a pointy head shape and i really thought it was i was guessing that it probably was a marlin it didn't have it wasn't like a swordfish or anything but it was quite the size uh, my boat is 24 feet this thing had to be at least 12 maybe 14 feet long uh, wow yeah it was amazing just to see it that silhouette pass under my boat yeah and then, so, you know, just a picture here again, kind of a nice kind of evening. And then you started not too long ago, this kind of came into your view. I wonder, you must have been pretty excited to see this view. Yes, I was. This is actually after a lot of hard work getting into uh, Albai Gulf. This is at the end of the Albai Gulf is Legazpi, where I am right now. So I entered the, the Albay Gulf and it took me a good day and a half before I could get to Legazpi. And this is Mount Mayon. It's an active volcano. It has an active chimney. It keeps uh, spewing smoke and steam. And every now and then when there's excessive rain that gets into the chimney, it will cough and uh spit lava and such and it is active it can be dangerous people used to climb it and then a few people died uh in minor eruptions and it's now banned i am yeah. debating whether i should have an adventure on it or not it's kind <laughs> of an iconic view this kind of volcanic cone yeah. rising from the ocean it is uh it is active very close to the city of Legazpi. Since it is actively escaping gas and such, it doesn't get to an explosive state. So it never blows its top or anything. It's not yeah. as dangerous. It also helps it maintain that perfect cone shape. It never loses that top. Okay, very cool. <laughs> and then if we jump in a little bit further, this is a pretty exciting moment. Yes. 
I was able to row my boat all the way into what's called the Banka Harbor. Bankas are those little uh, boats behind me. You see one of them behind me with outriggers on either side. They're yeah. select three pretty agile fishing vessels. So they tie their boats there, and I was able to get into that, tuck into that little harbor behind the breakwater. And uh, what you see there is the Philippine flag that I borrowed from one of the kayakers that visited me on the way in. The Coast Guard uh, vessel came and visited, uh, paced with me into Banka Harbor. Everybody was ready to receive me, all the officials, customs, immigration, health department. They wanted to see my vaccination card. <laughs> there you go. Getting greeting right now. Yes. Looks almost like a mini press conference as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we had these uniformed uh, soldiers walking me in, three on either side, six of them marching with me, with me in the middle. <laughs> I was there How, to, uh, for crowd control to protect me. I said, well, it didn't feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> How uh, were the legs? I remember we we shared the Guam video and you were a little shaky, but yeah, maybe this time you weren't kind of in the boat as long. I was. Uh, it, it was not that difficult getting off the boat. I had to swim the last seven eight meters to shore, and yeah. it was a pile of rocks, seawall that I had to climb to get up. And then uh, my legs, I still had that sea legs kind of drunken walk. Uh, the that went away in about 36 hours or so. The spongy feeling in my knees took about 72 hours to completely go away. Muscle tone will still take time. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I want to share. Oh, before we get to this image, I want to share a little video clip of what's happened uh, with your, your, your rowing boat uh, recently. So let me share this little clip here. I'll just lower the volume a bit so we can talk about it. But how much does the boat weigh, Aaron? I don't know if I, I don't know if we've ever asked that. My guess is it weighs about 800, 900 kilos loaded. So okay. the, empty, the empty weight of the plywood boat is about 250 kilos, and then if you add the battery and the ballast of 100 kilos of water and the supplies and whatnot. All of it probably adds up to put 800 kilos or so, maybe 900 is my wow. guess. So this kilos. French utility vessel, this barge, had a crane on board and we just walked in and I said, I have this rowboat that I brought across the boat to help us lift this. So I rowed the boat Your next to it. Set it down. We took the boat from the and lowered it onto the trailer directly. All right. Very cool. I'm, I'm, glad they, I'm glad they were able to help out. I'm just going to bring uh, one more photo into the call here before we, we bring Doug in, who's joining us behind the scenes. Oops, I'm going to have to fast forward to get to that. Oh, there it is. Uh, and so is this where she's sitting right now? This is the yard of the Alba Yacht Club. It's right now catering youth in small... Uh, Osgoose sailboats. They are larger. Imagine opties that are larger, more rectangular, can carry yeah. kind of sailboats with a gaff rigging. So they are operating out of this area and they will use this for storing other vessels as well once proper ramps and docks and such are constructed in the Legazpi waterfront. Uh, the Commodore is also a councilman for Legazpi and uh, Mr. Uh, Fernand Imperial. He also is involved in all of this and uh, this property he manages. It's becoming the boat yard now. Started with my boat too. <laughs> as a All right. And one more picture here. It looks like you're getting to see some of the sites as well. Yes, this was one of the waterfalls that they took me to. Uh, once I got past the <laughs> spongy knee issue, uh, I was able to get up to the base of this. It's about 75, 80 meters tall. It's a beautiful site and it was very much worth the effort to get there. Yeah. Uh, this is at the base of Mount Mayon, the volcano we were talking about. All right. So I'm going to pop these pictures out. 
And I think before we continue, I'm going to bring Doug in. We've got uh, those who have tuned into events before. No, Doug, Doug Woodring, uh, Ocean Recovery Alliance. Doug and Ryan have been creating an amazing series uh, in multiple languages. Uh, Westbound Wednesday is dropping new education material uh, during this expedition. Usually we're dragging Doug out of bed as well in Hong Kong, but he's in California right now. So I'm going to bring Doug in with us right now. Hey, Doug, how are you? Hello. Hey, Doug, we got you. We can hear you. I've got uh, I've got audio issues here, so sorry about that. I... That's okay. We can hear you Maybe just you fine. Maybe you can go to some school wanna... questions first. Okay, sure. All right. Well, Doug is there, and we'll talk a little bit more. I'll share a link as well where you can check out some of the education material. So, uh, Aridan, just before we jump into the classrooms, I do want to give a shout out to a few on YouTube. If you want to use that chat sidebar and send us in some questions there, I see Mysterian's group uh, and Miss Ardlin's group are here as well. You can use the private chat to send some of those questions in. Uh, but Okay, looks like we lost me for a sec, but I think I'm back. Uh, Erdin, before we grab a couple questions, can you just kind of tell us your plan for the next few days? Are you, where are you heading next? Are you heading to North America? I am in Legazpi right now. Uh, this is on the southeast corner of Luzon Island, the northernmost major island in the Philippines. I will uh, leave my rowboat here and by mid-April, I should fly out of Manila back home, which is in Gig Harbor, state of Washington. I will return here after the typhoon season, uh, probably have Christmas with my wife, and then fly here and do a few repairs on the rowboats. I had a storm December 2nd that caused some damage. I need to fix those. Then I'm, I will be looking at the currents and how the winds are setting up in the South China Sea, west of Luzon, to launch toward Vietnam. So January or February, I should be back on the water is my hope. All right. Amazing. I'm sure you're going to love some family time and, uh, yeah, a little time on land and then right back at it. And, and Yeah, I will yeah. bicycle from Legazpi to my... Uh, launch site, which will be either Subic Bay, uh, northwest of Manila, or north of Manila is San Fernando, uh, halfway up toward the tip of the island, which is farther north, which is likely where I will launch. It will give me better advantage toward Vietnam. All right. Well, Erdin, uh, Doug's still having some audio trouble, so I don't know if, if, if we'll be able to get Doug in, but we'll certainly try. For now, let's start grabbing some questions. I want to start, we'll grab a, a question from Mrs. Uh, Ardeline's group. Uh, Jaden wants to know, so even though plans changed, you know, we know initially the plans were were Hong Kong, but COVID and, and visa issues and things like that. I mean, expeditions, right? You have to be flexible. Plans yeah. change. So he, he's course. wondering, how do you feel right now about what you've done, about the accomplishment? How are you feeling? <laughs> I am feeling well because I did not define success as getting to Hong Kong. My goal was to get to the base of Everest to be able to climb it by human power. So I need to reach the shores of mainland Asia somehow. I reached Philippines. My boat is safe. I am safe. I will wait out the seasons, uh, the typhoon season especially. I cannot turn the into a gamble. I take calculated risks and I manage my expedition to remain safe. I need to keep my rowboat intact to be able to attack other bodies of water properly under my own power. So at this point I am very happy. I reached from North America to Asia, Philippines being an Asian country and South China Sea being a minor sea. The Pacific Ocean has been crossed by human power east to west in the Northern Hemisphere from mainland North America to Asia. That's a historic first. Nobody went from Hawaii due west. I did to Guam to Marianas and then from there across the Philippine Sea to Philippines 
and that has not been done either before. Everybody went all those uh, uh, rowboats and a propeller-driven boat by Jason Lewis, the first person to have done a human powered circumnavigation, a British man. He did that in 13 years. He went from uh, Hawaii southwest to Australia as well. Everybody was has been trying to go to Australia. So I'm the first one to have gone west and come to the Philippines. So that's a huge big deal. And that makes me feel very good. After I launched from uh, Crescent City in Northern California, I added two more Guinness World Records to my registered 15 records. The Overall days at sea that I rode, uh, including two-person rows, uh, is now a Guinness World Record. It's uh, 1,268, I think it is. I lost track. That uh, I took over. And also the most miles rode solo, I took that over as well after I left Hawaii. So these two and the solo days at sea total uh, has been increasing, career total. These three records, every morning I woke up, I had three new records. And that's been the case until I reached Philippines. So I think they will probably assign me the first crossing of the Pacific from North America to Asia as well. I may end up with 18 Guinness World Records. All right, not too shabby, and yeah, made it to Asia. It's pretty, pretty incredible. There's uh, lots of questions coming in now, Airden. So I'm going to try and work through a few of them. I think Doug's locked and loaded with us now too, so we'll bring him in shortly. Uh, I want to bring in Mr. Harrison's crew who are joining us virtually. We got Mr. Ma Mr. Harrison here. Hey, Mr. Harrison, how are you? Good, thanks. Yourself? Good, good. How's your crew today? Very nice. Yeah, everyone's having a really good time, and we've been really happy just to uh, track. Sort of the dis the journey from North America to Asia, which is really cool. Awesome. Does any of your crew have a question for us today? Uh, we did have a quick question about food. Um, and so, uh, do you have a particular favorite food that you've discovered on your journey? Uh -huh. uh, well, it all depends on my mood uh, of the day. Um, I randomly load my freeze-dried foods into holes below my deck. I separate simply the breakfast from dinners. And then I reach in and grab a bag and pull it out. Sometimes I like it. Sometimes I say, no, I don't want lasagna today. Just set it aside, grab another one until I find something that I like. Um, my favorite snack has been actually... Uh, dry roasted nuts varieties, the ones that you get at Costco in big plastic tubs, dry roasted unsalted variety. Those have been really uh, my favorites. I could, uh, I could have those with my protein bars, chocolate bars that are pro pro uh, chocolate flavored protein bars, and add those nuts into the mix and just munch down on those as snacks in the afternoons. I enjoyed those. They didn't last long. <laughs> I need to bring more of those with me for the South China Sea, for sure. All right. Awesome stuff. We've got uh, a few classrooms here joining us from California, and they've got a few questions here uh, in the chat for you. So I'm going to work a couple in now. One uh, is really curious about where this is Miss Beard's class, is wondering where you encountered the roughest seas in your journey. Uh, the roughest seas I encountered uh, happened to be in December. Uh, that's when I had a storm come and knock my boat over. Uh, I had rested in Waikiki for a month. I reached Waikiki September 11th, September 10th. I did not relaunch until October 7. I used that time to pursue visa to China as well unsuccessfully. But uh, made the major goal of that time was to wait out the, uh, just kill time, let the season advance so that I would not be caught by a hurricane or a remnant low west of Hawaii 
in October or November. And then October and November went very well. I had favorable currents with me. I was moving really quickly. I was trying to pace myself, slow it down so that I didn't go too far west too quickly. And then on December 2nd, the storm came and caught me. Uh, and I had a big wave come broadside, slam the boat, knock it down probably 120 degrees. It was upside down. I had tied myself to the mattress expecting that kind of uh, a, uh, con those kinds of conditions. So it was able to light itself. But I lost two spare oars in that, uh, that night. It, the worst of it was at night in the dark. Uh, and it turns out it actually caused damage on the boat too. Oh, wow. Yeah, the gunnel on the starboard side is separated from the bulkhead. There's crack there that I need to reinforce and fix when I come back. Also, the roof is cracked now. The supporting beam has separated from the bulkhead and the roof is leaking. When I was getting these torrential rains, uh, halfway from Guam to Philippines, it was dripping inside. And so I need to do a major repair operation to restore it. If I had received another broadside like that, knocking me down, or another storm like that later, it probably have would have caved my roof in and uh, caused significant damage. So I'm glad to be on shore, safe. <laughs> And uh, I can imagine. Wow, yeah. absolutely. I've lived um, another. I'm going to grab oh, one more question before we bring Doug in because we, we've got Doug with us right, right now. Uh, Miss Rhodes class wants to know about water. Where were you getting your fresh water from? I have what's called a desalination unit, it is a, a device with a high pressure chamber that forces seawater across a very tight membrane that filters salt out of the seawater and on the other side of the membrane fresh water sweats and is collected for drinking so this is the principle of the uh, reverse osmosis desalination unit that i have and it requires power, regular power. I get that power from my solar panels, 290 watts of production capacity I have to charge my 200 amp hour battery capacity, battery bank, two batteries, 100 each. And that has, uh, that feeds the 12 volt system that I have on board from that I am able to run this electric desalinator to produce four to six liters an hour of fresh water. Typically, I would make uh, two gallons, at least eight liters per day, because I use that water to drink it, to restore my freeze-dried foods, to reconstitute my freeze-dried foods, to make them edible, and also to rinse my rinse skin off, uh, salt off my skin and also to rinse my clothing. Salt water is quite hostile. It uh, desiccates, it dries the skin, and uh, we need to constantly rinse it to reduce the itching as well. Uh, it's quite a battle against the elements out there. Salt is not fun. It gets on everything, it corrodes everything, it's affects the skin health as well. All right, great question. There's a few more questions coming in via the chat, but I wanna bring Doug in first. I think we got you now, Doug. How's it going, Doug? Hi, Joe, hi, Erdin. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. I'm in sunny California today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, it's, you know, it's, we're used to Erdin moving around, but you're moving around on us today. <laughs> uh, I am. I. Uh, I'm waiting for Erdin to come onto this side of the world. He was coming to see us in Hong Kong. And uh, there's a few issues there with uh, with COVID and some policies. So once I got out, I sort of have been outside doing other work that we can do. So sorry to miss you there, Erdin, but we're gonna wait for you next, when, when you get started again. 
That's all right. The winds were not cooperating either. So here I am in Legazpi. We're still and making I have a, all as well. I, I have a good uh, challenge for people out there. I just thought of when you're talking about your storm issue and losing the oars. What if we give one of those pick me up bags to someone who finds your oar or one of them in the uh, ocean on the coast someday? Oh. Yeah, I, that's a, that's a good little challenge, huh? I don't know. Are they floating or did they sink? I have no idea. I think they may have some. Okay. Well, there you go. Someone might find it in 50 years and uh, you know, I'll have to remember that we put the challenge out. I'll take April one Fool's one. Day challenge. Yeah, I'll take one of my oars and put it in the water here in Legazpi, see if it floats, and I'll tell you. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Doug, I'm going to share a link here uh, that you shared with me earlier, a link to some of the education material. I know Ryan is in the chat as well today. Do you want to just um, briefly touch on on the material for any uh Yeah, please. For, the, yeah. for all the teachers out there, even adults, Ryan Chung, who's my colleague in Hong Kong, has been uh, – every week we put out an education blog called Westbound Rower. Uh, it's on Westbound Wednesdays, actually. That's And um, it's in English, Chinese, and Spanish. And we've had a bit of Turkish. Uh, it's on our website here. And really good information. We have over 33 weeks of content. So look back at it and go back and see what Airden did. It's everything related to water, survival, food, fish, birds, currents, weather. So there's a lot of neat things that you can use um, in your education program to inspire uh, anyone, kids or adults, to think about what was going on at sea when Airden was out there. And we'll continue this um, through Airden's journeys over time. But, you know, we've got a catalog now of over 30 weeks of great stuff, uh, thanks to Schroeder's in Hong Kong, who's also helped support that. And we just want people to learn from Airden experience. He's one of our ocean ambassadors for Ocean Recovery Alliance. And please share this because uh, what he's doing is is truly amazing. A lot of people can't really comprehend it. But once they get into it, they they, they just get so curious and excited. And that's what helps us and, and everyone uh, bring more awareness to the ocean and more curiosity and more knowledge about uh, its health and protecting it. So Thanks to Ryan and team, our team for the translation, uh, Nathan and Daniela uh, for doing the Chinese and the Spanish. And please get it out to your friends. All right. And uh, Doug, you mentioned the pick me up bags a bit earlier. I still have a few of the pick me up bags uh, okay. at home that I can send to classrooms. So uh, the kite surfers use those big, beautiful kites, but eventually they can't be used anymore. Uh, and they've been recycled into these beautiful bags that you can hitch on your hip when you're doing beach cleanups, uh, maybe out in the park and picking up plastic and other things. Beautiful bags, Westbound Rower logo on them. So let's put our heads together, Doug, and issue one last challenge, uh, and I'll send it out to the North American classroom. So we'll have a think about that after the call. Yeah, well, the main thing we want to know is you as a... Uh, uh audience today the the children you know what inspires you from Airden's trip that's the question if you can send it in to joe or or us at ocean recovery the and the best question the best answers will get you one of these bags we'll send a few of them out what inspires you and then what might be your plan for protecting the ocean uh somehow even it, either in the short term in the next few weeks or months, or maybe in the long term, maybe in five years or 10 years when you're older. Um, we'd love to hear what you're thinking about that. So uh, send us your ideas. We'll get you one of these pick me up bags if you win. They're cool. All right. Awesome stuff, Doug. Uh, and a huge shout out to Ryan, who I know is manning the chat right now as well. So great to see uh, you joining us today, too, Ryan. What do you say, Erdin? We still have a few more minutes. Should we grab some more questions? Yes, definitely. One comment that I want to make is, as I was coming across the ocean, after I left California, I could see plastic pollution on the water, a styrofoam cup here, a plastic bit here, a fender that's loose, uh, maybe once a week. And then as I came farther across and closer to the Philippines past Guam, I started seeing them every day 
then every hour I started seeing them. So the concentration of the plastic pollution started increasing. That uh, has a lot to do with the winds, the way they flow, uh, they blow, and also the currents that uh, carry these across and the concentration increases in various areas. So all these uh, windward facing uh, islands have their beaches covered with debris that comes from across the ocean from afar. And that is never a good thing. I have, Legazpi is a blessed place with whale sharks that are swimming right next to the shore. Uh, uh, just today uh, or yesterday, I sailed in the afternoon with a small sailboat here, an Oz Goose sailboat. And we spotted two whale sharks that are docile creatures. They just uh, have these big mouths open like <laughs> an ice cream cone swimming, <laughs> mouth open in the water and collecting algae and small fish as they go. Of course, they scoop up plastic as well. Their guts eventually would fill with plastic and then get stuffed and die of hunger of all things because they can't replace that space with food anymore. So that's a common problem with the turtles and fish and the large whale sharks as well. Even whales get affected by this. Yeah, I read some stories recently. Uh, you know, whenever whales wash up on shore, they usually kind of take a look and try and figure out and sometimes 80, 90 plastic bags in their stomachs. It's, it's really hard to tell the difference sometimes. Um, between Thank food and, and, and what's not. Yes. Yeah, and oh, whale sharks. Aaron, I'm so jealous. I, I love whale sharks. They're, I think they're such beautiful, and beautiful, biggest fish on the planet. I'm trying to arrange a swim with the whale sharks. And there are places where they are in hot, uh, high in concentration. There are a lot of them. And you yeah. can actually swim with them without touching, of course. Well, we want to see some photos if that happens. I'm sure that would okay. be amazing. Uh, let's grab a couple more questions and then we'll let you, cause I know it's getting later in the evening for you. So Mr. Harrison's crew, do you guys have a follow-up for us? Uh, we just had one more question. So Serena asked, uh, Arden, do you get seasick and what do you do about seasickness? I do not get seasick anymore. I, my inner ear is very much used to the pe peculiar movement of my rowboat. I used to get affected in the first two days or so, and then it would subside. What I did uh, on departure was to bring along uh, some bananas because uh, bananas taste just as good coming up as they do going down. <laughs> so you can, if you throw up, taste like bananas. Uh, nothing acidic uh, helps. Uh, and... I basically would stay uh, out, tire myself quite a bit, hydrate while outside, eat bananas, and if I wanted to eat anything else, I would also eat it outside. And as long as I see the horizon, it's uh, not a problem. The issue, the, the problem, uh, uh, the reason that one gets seasick is due to the discrepancy of what our eyes see and what the inner ear feels. So if I am inside the cabin looking at the ceiling or if I am looking down at uh, a book or, or trying to type a message, text something on my smartphone, then I am looking at something that is relatively stable because I'm trying to read it and stabilize it in front of my eyes. So it doesn't move, but my inner ear feels the movement of the boat. Where, so. The best solution is to be outside, working, seeing the horizon, feeling the movement of the boat. As the boat moves, I can see the horizon move too. Then that quiets down that seasick feeling. So tire myself, stay outside, so that if I go inside, I sleep immediately and I don't feel anything. I can get back out and work again. So working hard and staying outside is really the solution yeah i uh i've heard a lot of seasickness tips but the banana one is new they taste <laughs> just as good coming up the uh, problem is it brings fruit flies on board i had fruit flies all the way from hawaii 
to Guam, they were just faster. And I, I got very good at this t- killing them <laughs> flicks of my hair. Yeah. After a while, it was entertainment too. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to grab another question here. Uh, well, actually, a comment that I want to put in for Miss uh, Ardeline's class. They're saying that they love to see your sense of humor. Uh, and they're, they're thinking that your positive approach and your growth mindset is probably what really helped keep you going uh, yeah. over the last several months. Yep, me saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've got Miss Nilvo's crew. They are joining us in um, New Mexico. And Kenzie would like to know, because you mentioned the boat capsized. So can you, you, you've shared this with us in past calls, but can you touch on how your how the boat deals with capsizing? Right. So this boat is known to be of shape writing variety. So the design of the boat relies on the shape of the boat to write it. And deck is covered. So it doesn't get flooded and sink. So the deck is covered and under the deck are storage areas where I keep my food. And there's ballast down there as well, below my rowing station. The boat came with 150 liters worth of space that was used to stack five liter jugs of water. So I took 50 of those, 50 liters of it out, 10 jugs came out, and I created 50 liters of space to put more food, and I buried 50 kilos of lead shot, mixed it with epoxy, put it very deep in the boat so that it became permanent ballast. So I have 100 liters of water, spare water that I can carry, and also the food and supplies below deck. So those are where the center of gravity lies in the boat, low below my rowing station. And then we have the cabin itself and the storage area up front too. Those have buoyancy. As long as my cabin is not flooded and I keep my cabin door shut in heavy weather and waves come, push the boat over, When the boat goes sideways, the cabin has buoyancy that's trying to lift it up. The ballast and the storage of food that I have below deck are heavy. They're trying to push the boat down. So the combined effect is very strong riding moment that puts the boat right back up. And so uh, the boat does not like to be on its side at all. And if the boat goes over, It'll come right side up again, and if it rolls with a uh, breaking wave, it should just keep rolling and come right side up again. As long as I have the cabin not flooded, I am good. If I am inside the cabin when this happens, I need to tie myself to the mattress to stay with the mattress. If it rolls and I am thrown at the ceiling, then that's a big problem because then I am shifted ballast. I would be sitting on the ceiling in an upside down boat and it would never ride itself. So uh, in December when I had that storm, I had tied myself anticipating that the weather would be rough. So when it got knocked over about 120 degrees, I stayed on the mattress and was able to ride itself again and all was well. All right. Well, Erdan, I I know it's getting late there, but, you know, I speak for all of the classrooms, all of the students. We've had uh, well over 100 classrooms, which is thousands of students join us at various stages, some all the way along throughout uh, your journey. So it's been such a pleasure to be able to follow along, uh, to follow your progress. It's been a pleasure to have Doug and Ryan behind the scenes uh, putting together. I'll, I'll bring Doug in here now, too putting together some great material, including the pick-me-up bags and, you know, some well-deserved R&R coming your way. And then we can't wait to follow along as the journey continues. Yes. January onward, we will be on the journey again. I will bicycle from Legazpi to my point of launch on the west side of Luzon Island. And then I'll be on the 
South China Sea toward hopefully Vietnam. If I cannot make Vietnam, it'll be the Malay Peninsula. If I cannot make that, it'll be the archipelago south of uh, Singapore, Indonesian islands there. I may, if I am carried that far south, I may have to drop anchor and wait until May or so, until the monsoons start reversing, currents start reversing. So the ocean is in charge. I do my best and destiny will reveal itself. <laughs> all right. And Doug, great to see you today as well. And thank you for all the great material that you and Ryan have been building all along. Yeah, thanks for promoting it. And uh, we hope to keep it continued. But please, everyone, go back and, and look at some of the some of these uh, posts that we have there because they're, they're pretty neat. And it'll, it'll really inspire some discussion in your classrooms and in your families and with your friends and things. All right. Well, Aaron, keep us up to date on the whale sharks. If the whale sharks happen, uh, and then, yeah, we can't wait uh, to carry on with you and and continue your journey around the planet. I will try to get my GoPro into the water with the whale sharks if it happens, for sure. All right. Well, a huge shout out to all the classrooms who joined us. I know it was a quick, short notice event, but it's always great to see you. A shout out to all the classrooms who will be watching this uh, via YouTube later this week and into next week. And yeah, we're not going to stop following this journey. We can't wait for the next round. Thank you so much, Doug. Thank you so much, Ayrton. And we will see you soon. Safe travels. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. See you soon.